Uh, hey, everybody. Thanks uh, for coming. So first off, thank you to the, uh, the organizers uh, for inviting me back uh, for my second chance to talk at, at AppSec Cali. Uh, certainly one of the uh, best physically located conferences in the security community. Um, this is a lot better uh, than a windowless concrete box out in the desert, uh, as all of us experience in the summer. Um, let me apologize for my voice. So uh, who here has kids? Yeah, so you guys understand that living with three kids is like living in a CDC hot zone. Um, and so uh, everybody in my family has a cold, and I thought, like, oh, this is, this is the one I'm going to beat. And then I woke up like this. Um, so I'll try, to, I'll try to speak up. So uh, last time I was here, I talked about uh, kind of the model of how uh, this idea of software eating in the world, of how the, the growth of software in every space uh, is, is revolutionizing um, over almost every part of human endeavor and how the, the corollary to that is that in that world then application security and software security is going to eat all of security. Um, and so uh, we talked a lot about kind of the technical details of what that means at scale or in the cloud. And I, I was very lucky to have Jeff Williams here to demonstrate because of somebody over two meters uh, to use as a physical uh, example of how fast uh, Ethernet packets travel at 100 gigabits uh, per second. Um, but today I thought I'd zoom out a little bit and talk a little bit about some of the things that have become pretty obvious to me uh, in the about year and four months that I've been out of uh, the big tech industry. Um, and I've realized that uh, one of the core problems of the tech companies actually is kind of a emotional and physical one for the people who are working there. And that when you work at these companies, uh, you are constantly moving from emergency to emergency. There was never not a fire at either Facebook or Yahoo. My, my time there, um, I cannot think of one point at which I could sit down and just do something proactive. Everything was reactive. Um, and it took me about a year to detox from that experience where I wasn't picking up my phone at 3 a.m. wondering if there was a coup in a country that we were involved in, if there was a, uh, a, a, you know, a murder-suicide somewhere, um, if there was a massive you know, child safety case or a kidnapping. Like, that's the kind of stuff that you deal with at scale. And it makes it very difficult to deal, you get very good at reacting very quickly, but it makes it very difficult to deal with the bigger picture issues that our industry are facing. Um, and I think it's going to be important for those of you who have to work with these issues, I mean, one of my personal suggestions is one, just to recognize that there is a personal tool uh, to working at big companies um, that <clears throat> you should not underestimate. Uh, but the second is, that there is value to the company of you being able to step aside and step back. So if, you, if you're one of those growth stage companies that's getting really big, <coughs> excuse me, um, then my recommendation is to definitely build a situation in which your executives have that ability to, without quitting, um, have the ability to kind of think about what some of the bigger pictures are. And so what I thought I'd do is talk about some of the kind of the fundamental challenges the tech industry is facing right now, how we screwed up, and then some suggestions of what we do better. And I think I'll hopefully have a little time at the end for some discussion. Um, so the first real kind of basic fundamental problem is that nobody likes trade-offs. Now this is a pretty universal thing, right? Like nobody wants to trade off anything anytime. Um, this is obvious since we're in an election year uh, and politicians love to promise things like, uh, you know, I can take crime rates down without affecting people's civil liberties. Um, I can give everybody health care without raising your taxes, right? Like these are the kinds of promises politicians make because it does not sell well to actually be honest with folks. And so this is a, a, a universal problem um, that people don't like trade-offs. Uh, but in the tech industry, it's specifically acute because the basic trade-offs are not understood. So even to the extent that people don't like trade-offs, if they don't understand they exist, then you can't even have a discussion of what are the kind of equities you're trying to balance when you make certain decisions. So kind of the classic example from engineering of an optimization problem of a trade-off is the saying, I can build something for you, you can have it fast, correct, or cheap, pick two of three. Right? So a classic engineering trade-off, the idea that you pick a point within this triangle, and by picking that point within the triangle, you have decided how you're going to balance these equities. I once gave a talk to a bunch of Air Force generals, and one of them pointed out the best way to get none of these is to use the Pentagon procurement process. Um, <laughs> so it's not universally accepted that this trade-off actually exists. There are situations that you can be suboptimal below this, but even in the optimal case, it's very hard to do better than to, to do some kind of trade-off in here. When we come to like the relationship between large technology companies and the world, it turns out that the trade-offs are much more numerous um, and the relationship with them is much more complex. Um, and so I try just to represent 
some of the basic issues, and this is specifically in a product like a Facebook or Google or Microsoft, a consumer product, a product that people have user-generated content that they're using to communicate with one another, that these are all equities that a lot of people would agree are good equities, right? Like if I pulled the room, who here thinks, you know, people should be able to exist online and not be harassed and bullied? Right. Okay. I saw you're canceled, sir. You did not raise your hand. Um, who, that's a power they've given me as the keynote speaker. Um, who, who here believes uh, that people should have privacy in their, in their communications? Right. So you can't have both of those. Right? Like those are two equities that are in, in complete unbalance. And so it, it turns out the relationship between these, unlike in the triangle, um, is actually complicated and nonlinear. So if you move to any of these equities, you end up moving away from other equities in a way that's very hard to predict. And there's, there's a bunch of different trade offs here, and we could spend all day talking about it. But there's two kind of meta issues that I think are really critical that are are kind of subconsciously dominating the discussion. Um, and one of the things I try to do now that I am a fake professor and get to go around and speak, not on behalf of a company, um, is I'd like to bring out the subtext into text because I think as a society, unless we deal with those trade-offs in an explicit and thoughtful way, we're going to end up making bad decisions. And the two kind of meta issues are on openness versus competitiveness versus privacy, um, and then privacy versus safety. Right? So on the privacy versus safety, that's effectively what I was talking about, about bullying and harassment versus private communication. Um, and it's a pretty obvious one to grasp for technologists because the great example here is end-to-end -end encrypted products like iMessage and WhatsApp and such, where clearly, to, if you're a technologist, it becomes obvious that if in a situation where you don't have access to people's data, you can then not police that data to see if it's harmful to other people. Right? And the granting of privacy, you know, when I was at Facebook, WhatsApp turned on end-to-end -end encryption. That was the largest increase in personal privacy in the history of the human race, bar none. There was no event in the history of humanity where more people got the ability to communicate privately with one another um, without that being accessible to incredibly powerful organizations like big corporations and governments uh, and even to other people, right? So biggest privacy uplift in history, probably, the encryption of WhatsApp. Um, but the flip side was, is it effectively forestalled almost any of the kind of stuff we were able to do on Facebook's other platforms to prevent the product from being used to cause other people harm, right? So the incredible stuff that we do, uh, that you have people who are incredibly dedicated to do things like to detect the sexual abuse of children, impossible in end-to-end encryption. Looking for people who might be suicidal and who are being pushed to commit suicide, which is actually a significant problem at scale, completely impossible with end-to-end -end encryption. So that is a very hard trade-off. Now, there are ways that you can make the trade-off a little better. There are ways that you can look for technological solutions to some of these issues. WhatsApp has tried to work on that. Um, in a couple of cases, like political misinformation that leads to incitement of violence this has been a, a big issue for WhatsApp in India and Sri Lanka, for example. And so looking at how the product is designed, you can make decisions about how are people allowed to invite other folks into groups? How many times can a message be forwarded? What, you know, what kind of amplification tools do you give individuals? And so there are tweaks you can make. This. So it doesn't mean that you can't do anything. But there is a hard trade-off there. Um, and it's a trade-off that people don't talk about explicitly. And the fact that it's not talked about explicitly then makes it very hard to decide whether you're doing the right thing or not or to have any kind of democratic process to do it. Um, the other one is the, the, the competitive risk versus data privacy issue, which is the other big issue we're dealing with is that there's a handful of very, very big tech companies, you know, the Fanes. I don't like the Fanes so much because Netflix doesn't really count. I mean, Netflix is, does not dominate entertainment like, well, I mean, who here has like a script out to Netflix right now? We are in LA. So, you know, I expect half the people here have spec scripts they're gonna send to 10 Sarandos um, over there. Um, but like, you know, Netflix isn't really a dominate, but like Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, those companies have an incredibly dominating lead in a bunch of very important places. Uh, and there are natural economies of scale in their businesses. But one of the things for the consumer businesses that they own that is the most valuable thing is they own people's data and they own the knowledge of people's relationships with one another, right? And so that is the kind of thing that gives them oligopic power, is the ability to know who your friends are, what your relationships are like. Um, and their ability to lock that up is, is what allows them to, to, to keep competitors from, from, from coming in. But the 
situation in which one of these companies was the least monopolistic was Facebook shipping this thing called Graph API v1, which is the API that was behind the Cambridge Analytica scandal. And so there's a hard trade-off there. If you want the ability for there to be, for, for individuals, if you want to say individuals own their own data, which is something I think a lot of people in here would agree with, then you have a di very difficult problem of those people consciously deciding to take that data to a place where people are going to abuse it. And where the rubber hits the road here for any kind of product that has interpersonal communication on it is whose data is it, right? A bunch of people in here have Gmail inboxes. You would say that that's your data. But my Gmail inbox has information from probably 20,000 counterparties, right, for organizations and individuals I've interacted with over the last 10 years. Is that my data to take places? If I take all of my Gmail data with all of that communication and the knowledge of who those people are somewhere else, am I allowed to do that? And you see this problem encoded in the law. Everybody knows about GDPR in Europe. What you might not know is that GDPR is basically completely self-refuting, that you can't follow its scriptures to both protect data and then also allow for data portability. There's an entire article that says that you have to allow people to take all their data out. Well, the last time Facebook allowed people to take all their data out, um, that turned into the biggest privacy scandal and the largest fine in FTC history, right? Um, and so that's like, because we don't talk about that being an actual trade-off, we end up in this place where politicians and the media kind of act like children and they stomp their feet and they want it all, and they want it all at the same time, and they don't understand that they can't have both marshmallows. You can have the marshmallow now or the marshmallow later, and you can't have them both. Um, but this is a problem that then we have made worse in tech. We've made worse in tech through a couple of things. One, we just haven't been honest about the trade-offs. Um, you know, the, the overall kind of design of tech PR is around you know, the, the pinnacle of, of tech's relationship with the press is Steve Jobs' iPhone keynote, right? Um, which every once in a while you should watch that. Uh, because what you'll realize is that what he did with that iPhone keynote is what every other CEO has been trying to do ever since that day when they get on stage and they talk to the world. Um, and it's all about optimism. It's all about positivity. There is never a mention that there's anything that possibly could be pro possibly negative about any Apple product ever, right? And that is how all of Silicon Valley acts now, um, is that we've all adopted this kind of Apple idea of the things we make are perfect the people who use them are perfect and beautiful. Nothing possibly could ever go wrong as long as you have $1,100 to buy a phone, right? <laughs> and, and so that kind of interaction with the world makes it very difficult to talk about trade-offs, right? Like that keynote would not be celebrated. It would not have like 10 million views on YouTube. If Steve Jobs went out there and talked about this product is gonna have a lot of utility, but it's also gonna really screw up people's per interpersonal relationships because you're gonna sit at dinner tables with your teenager staring at this screen all day, right? Like little, little less salesman-like. Um, and so because we don't talk about those trade-offs, we end up setting unrealistic expectations and then we violate those expectations. Children, the media, politicians, users, they're like children, they want everything at the same time. We tell them they can have everything at the same time. And so we build the expectation that nothing can ever go wrong, that you're living in this, this beautiful cocoony bubble, um, and that having one thing does not mean giving up something else. And it's the violation of those expectations where you end up with the real problem. If, if you've got to make a decision about how to balance equities in almost anything, as long as you're honest with people about the balance you're taking, about what you're doing, about what the trade-offs are, then generally people will, even if they disagree with your dis final decision, they'll generally accept the idea that you were making a reasonable decision here. But that is not what we do. And that is how you end up with my old boss uh, in front of the Senate explaining to them, one, how Facebook make money selling ads, um, but also being attacked both for not protecting people's data enough while also being monopolist, um, for not giving people enough privacy while not also finding every single bad guy at the same time. Like if you watch any of these Senate hearings, you realize that the members of Congress, one, have no fundamental understanding of how these technologies work. Um, but they also don't believe that there's any trade-off here, that the reason why technology is not perfect is because the people making decisions are venal and evil and just care about money or just not good people. Not that there actually are hard trade-offs and decisions that you have to make. And in tech, we've made that much worse by the way we, we approach the world. And so what's one way that we can do better in tech? Um, and I think one of the key points here is just going to be honesty and transparency and predictability. The 
another fundamental problem, which we'll get to in a second, is that these companies are making decisions in a way that is completely impossible to predict what they're doing. And so if you're going to make decisions that are so incredibly powerful, that maybe do things like change the outcome of elections or change the future of democracy in certain parts of the world, then you need to be in a place where people can have a reasonable prediction of what you're gonna do, not just upon what is like in the short term interest, but based upon some kind of moral guidance and, and values that you have as a company. And, and then they have to allow for external criticism and, and validation. And the truth is, is that the companies are so careful to control what you know about them. Like we know effectively nothing about how YouTube enforces the rules against certain kind of hateful content on YouTube. We know nothing about how those decisions are made. And so as a result, there's no way to, for somebody to say they're doing a good job. There's only the ability to point out the times they make mistakes. And so I know that they're probably in some of these categories of abuse catching 99.5% of the bad stuff. But because they don't talk about it, they don't talk about how those decisions are made, they don't talk about the trade-offs that they thought about when they had to make those decisions, nobody can validate for that for them. They only focus on the 0.5% that they don't catch. Um, and so that lack of openness is something that's going to have to change in the relationship between the tech industry and the rest of the world. The second related issue here, a fundamental challenge, is that massive tech companies are effectively acting as pseudo-governments. They are providing services to individuals that before the last 30 years were completely the responsibility of sovereign governments that hopefully in the case of democracies were transparent and responsible to individuals. This is a fundamental, fundamental problem. Um, and uh, where this really breaks down is that these companies, while acting like governments, are not able to provide the transparency people expect from their government, and they certainly don't provide any kind of ability to have democratic input. Uh, now, there's a, some real fundamental challenges here in that there's no good mechanism to allow a company that services over a billion people some way for those people to have some say in how they are governed, right? Um, and when we talk about some of these services, I mean, you know, anybody here want to explain what's changed in the law since the 2016 election, um, since we learned about Russian interference in 2016? Anybody want to, anybody know what, what major change Congress made to fix those problems? Yeah, that's the right answer. They've done nothing. Congress has effectively done absolutely nothing since 2016. Um, they've passed a couple of bills that have given some funding for election security. Those bills don't actually have any security requirements, so they're effectively slush funds that have been distributed out to a bunch of states that have been spent on the same shitty old uh, insecure voting machines. But on like core disinformation issues, on like the issues we were dealing with at Facebook, Congress has done nothing. Effectively, the decision of what is the regulatory framework for online election ads in the United States is a decision that has been made inside of Twitter, Google, and Facebook completely privately without any public input, without any kind of democratic process and in a way that's totally different for those three different companies. And that's because governments have effectively completely stepped back and not taken any responsibility for fixing any of these issues. And so the companies are acting like governments. They're making incredibly important decisions. Nick Clegg, who used to be the deputy prime minister of the UK, is now the head of policy at Facebook. And last year during European parliamentary elections, he flew to Brussels and he gave a speech in the European Parliament in which he told the European parliamentarians the rules under which they would be operating when running political ads for re-election in the European Parliament. It's because the European Parliament nor none of the, the states themselves passed any laws saying how are online ads supposed to be regulated. Um, and so he had to go and tell them this is what the rules are gonna be like. That's freaking insane, right? Like this is not how we should be operating democratic governments to have these decisions made by trillion dollar corporations, possibly for mostly their own good, or based upon you know, them trying to avoid regulatory scrutiny or media scrutiny. And so that responsibility to act as governments is something that will always exist, but it could be better if we ended up having a political system that was actually had the guts to go solve some of these issues instead of just yelling at the people who, who are actually doing the work. Um, where the companies have made this much worse is they have not engaged governments productively or proactively. And so one of the fundamental issues the tech companies have had is that they've resisted any kind of tech regulation over and over again. That there are these massive policy teams at each of these companies. Google has hundreds and hundreds of lobbyists in DC. And almost every single one of them, their job is to say, no, don't do anything, right? That's what they do all day. They don't 
provide solutions, they don't provide suggestions. They just point out, well, no, if you, if you regulate in some way, there might be something bad that happens. And so you can do that for a while. You can hire a ton of lobbyists. You can have political action committees that give money to the right chairman and chairwomen. Um, you can try to resist any kind of regulatory movement. But in the end, the pressure builds up. And then when the dam breaks, it breaks in a really stupid way. And that's what we saw with GDPR is that the, the US tech industry had an opportunity to lead on what global privacy law would look like. And by resisting the ability for the United States to do anything, by helping kill every proposal for a federal privacy law in the US, we kicked it to the European Parliament, which is really not the people that you want deciding for anything really complex that affects lots of people. Um, there's, there's good people. I work now with a, an ex-European parliamentarian, Amrisha Shaki, um, from the Netherlands. She's incredibly smart um, and thoughtful, uh, which is perhaps why she's no longer in the European Parliament. Um, <laughs> but there's a, a, you know, one of the things that people have told me is that uh, in Europe, sometimes the European Parliament is the place they send their crazy legit. Like if you're in a political party and you've got somebody nuts that you don't want in your country anymore, you send them to Brussels, right? Um, and so there's that problem, but there's also the fundamental problem of the European Parliament is very kind of democratically disconnected from actual citizens. Um, and they pass these laws that are then interpreted by every single state. It's so like one of the fundamental problems of GDPR is that nobody knows what it actually says. Anybody who tells you that they know what GDPR says is trying to sell you something, right? And they are lying because they don't know because the actual technical impact of what is GP, how does GDPR impact the decisions of any individual tech company or really any company that has personal data is based upon the decisions of 27 different state level data protection authorities. And in the case of Germany, 13 level, 13 state, uh, uh, effectively city and county level because of this weird history of the unification of Germany or whatever. The city of Hamburg, which has fewer citizens than the county in which I live in in Northern California, has their own data protection authority that gets to make their own interpretation of what GDPR means. And so we're in this crazy world because the tech companies did not work productively, that they allowed this pressure to build up and for this law to be passed that has now become an effectively a disaster for lots of folks. Funny enough, not for the big tech companies. GDPR is fantastic for Google and Facebook. In fact, um, Google's market share of third-party ads in Europe has massively increased since the GDPR. And it's because I know Facebook had about 500 lawyers whose entire job it was to work on GDPR. Facebook can have lawyers in every single European capital whose job it is to go to every little local talk um, and every open hearing by the Data Protection Commission and to write memos about what the hell does Article 14 mean in Belgium, right? Like, they have the ability to do that. Some 30 or 40 person competitor does not have the ability to do that. Um, and so that kind of regulatory overhead has actually been fantastic for a small number of oligopolists. And so perhaps that's why they were actually okay with it passing. Um, because in the long run, GDPR is gonna mean that there will only be two or three companies um, that are gonna have the ability to sell ads in Europe online. Um, but you know, I think overall, it's, it's been a mistake. Um, and the key solution is pretty reasonable, which is the companies need to welcome regulation, but when they do so, they have to be very careful to do so while protecting human rights. Because one of the equities we haven't talked about yet is um, how many people here believe tech companies should not be above the law? How many people believe tech companies should support human rights? Yeah, again, can't have both of those, not globally at least. Right? You can't say that companies should follow the law in every jurisdiction to which they are responsible and then also protect human rights because there's lots of countries where the law does not protect human rights. Um, a lot of people have talked about the interaction between uh, Facebook and the, the genocide of the Rohingya in Myanmar. And something that gets lost in the conversation is that the Myanmar situation is not some uh, you know, kind of uh, bottoms up grassroots ethnic violence. This is a genocide that is being conducted by the government, by uniformed military members who are building concentration camps, who are ethnically cleansing the north of the country. Um, and they are using Facebook and other tools to support this, right? That is the actions of the government. Um, and so in a situation like that, the idea that tech companies should be subservient to the laws passed by a government who are willing to ethnically cleanse their own people is clearly wrong. But that makes it very difficult because now we come up in a situation where we're saying, well, you should follow the law sometimes, right? Um, and which none of the companies I think have effectively done have communicated. The truth is they all make these decisions all the time. Uh, when I was at Facebook, we had to evacuate our Thai office, our office in, in Bangkok, um, because we were in a fight with the Thai government over turning over information 
on individuals involved in protests against the ruling military junta. Um, we were violating the law, right? And they were physically threatening our employees. So a couple of them got uh, all expenses paid trip to Singapore uh, to, with their families so that they could wait it out. Um, and so in a situation like that, what the standard should be to decide what laws applies and what don't, that's an incredibly powerful thing for the companies to do. And what they haven't really done is communicated what is the standard by which they do that. And personally, I think there are human rights standards out there. There are a bunch of um, UN charters and other kinds of basics of, of international law that you can cite of this is why, these are the rules we're going to follow and the ones we don't. Um, because it turns out some of these rules are very different in different situ situations. Probably the, the, the way the dam really broke on pe controlling people's political speech online was the, a German law called NetzDG, uh, which forced the tech companies to enforce German hate speech law, which as you know, is much, much stricter uh, than most of Europe and certainly much stricter than the United States where we have the First Amendment. It's totally understandable why a country like Germany would want that. But other countries like Turkey and Vietnam have adopted laws that are effectively exactly the same, but the application of those laws in those countries is very, very different. And so trying to make that decision and coming up with a distinction of, we're gonna follow the law in Germany because we think this is respectful of human rights, but we're not gonna do it in Turkey, that's actually a really hard decision to make. And I would like these companies to be a little more honest about when they're doing it or not. The reason they're not is because they wanna sell ads or sell product in every single country in the world. Um, the other company that's really kind of silently skidded by on this is, is really Apple. Um, and that Apple loves to do these keynotes where they have the word privacy in huge Helvetica, you know, seven feet tall in that brand new beautiful arena that they have on their campus in the, the spaceship in Cupertino. And privacy, we care about privacy. And they, they leave off the asterisks of this offer not valid in the People's Republic of China. And that Apple has completely and totally sold out there are millions and millions of consumers that use their product in China by deciding not to encrypt iCloud, data in iCloud and then turning over the storage of that data to a company that is controlled by the Chinese government. Um, and so that allows them to wash their hands of we're not turning over data to the Chinese. It just happens to be the Gunzhou Big Data Cooperative Limited or whatever they call it. Um, it's their decision, right? Uh, and so that kind of decision, it's too late. Like we're not gonna get Apple to pull that back. Um, Apple's in a very tough situation. They ship a physical product. For countries to control a physical product is much easier than a web service or a, a mobile application that can slip across borders easily. Um, the other problem is that Ch Apple's entire, uh, you know, something like two million people work on Apple products in China, if you look at the entire supply chain. Uh, and so if the PRC decided to make Apple disappear, if they decided to make the $1.3 trillion or whatever market cap disappear, that is completely within the power of the Chinese Communist Party. Now that means unemploying two million people, right? So that, that doesn't happen unless they have a really good reason. But the amount of leverage the Chinese have over Apple is, is spectacular. Um, but unfortunately, Apple wasn't thinking about these things. And they kind of, I think, convince themselves that they're the good guys. They listened to their own press that they're the good guys and they're making good decisions. And they allowed themselves to put themselves in a situation where now they wake up and they've done something completely unconscionable. Um, and so my suggestion to other folks is to think about these things well ahead of time because once you make those decisions, it's really hard to get out of them. Um, and then that's related to another key challenge, which is tech has become a key battleground of major power competition as well as asymmetric warfare between people uh, around the world against large powers. Um, I am, in theory, an adjunct professor of international relations. I have never taken an international relations class, um, which tells you something about the education students are getting at Stanford for $51,000 a year. <laughs> um, but the reason uh, why I'm the least qualified person uh, in Encina Hall uh, at Stanford um, is because there is not an area of any of my other colleagues who focus on relations in the Middle East, who focus on great power competition to the US and Russia, who focus on the rise of China. There's not a single area of theirs that hasn't been completely revolutionized by the rise of cyber warfare as a legitimate component of, of competition. Um, and this has this has become kind of one of the defining issues of the internet is that it is not just a neutral product uh, or uh, a neutral network where people can use products and they can opt into doing fun things and they can make these decisions individually. Um, every person who's using the internet is, is part of this kind of network of competition even if they don't understand it. That their decisions are being shaped uh, by the governments uh, that control them and by other governments. 
And we're all basically pawns in this incredible game that a number of people are playing. Now, I think there's a couple different games going on. Um, right now, what I would say is that um, Uncle Sam, like the way I try to imagine this is you've got um, Uncle Sam and a Russian bear in a Russian army cap are sitting and they're drinking, like the, the bear's drinking vodka and Uncle Sam's drinking whiskey and they're playing drunk checkers at, against each other, right? Like they're, they're yelling and screaming at each other and playing checkers and every once in a while the Russian bear just swipes the checkers on the ground and says, I don't wanna play this game anymore, I'm gonna change the rules. Um, and quietly a guy in a, a Mao outfit, um, the Chinese are sitting in the corner and very soberly sipping tea and playing Go. Right? That is effectively what cyber competition is like right now. And that we have all this focus on the Russian Federation and their activity to screw with us. And we're very loud and obvious about it. And the, and the Russians are very loud and obvious about their actions um, because they don't mind getting caught. The fact that they're doing this is part of the message that they're sending, that they're not a failing petrochemical state with half the GDP of California that has to continuously um, increase its social security retirement age. No, that's not what they are. They are a great power com competitor. They are an equal to the United States and that is part of the message they send through their cyber operations. Um, whereas the People's Republic of China has a 100 year plan and they're executing that plan day after day after day. Um, and online competition is a big, big part of that. Um, tech companies have made this worse in that first we haven't really recognized our importance, right? Um, everybody in Silicon Valley says we're gonna change the world, but nobody really believes it. It's kind of like the thing you say to get people to come work for you. It's become like the standard, we're changing the world through revolutionizing juice squeezing, right? Like, <laughs> um, so everybody says that shit. Uh, but it turns out for a couple of these companies, we really should have believed it, right? We really should have believed that we were changing the world, that we were revolutionizing the way people were gonna interact with each other. We revolutionized how people run for office or um, stand in democracies or the way kids get educated or um, the ability for you know, people who have always existed to connect with one another and now build things like the alt-right and the white nationalist movements and kind of um, global uh, populism and the growth of that based upon the internet. We didn't really very, we didn't quickly enough understand that we were behind a lot of this um, because we didn't really believe that we're changing the world. We thought we were just having fun and building some cool shit um, and operating at scale and cashing our RSUs um, and spending on a really too expensive houses uh, in the, the Bay Area. And so that was a key problem is that the companies came way too late to understanding their importance. Um, but the other is that security and privacy have never been kind of integral practices in these companies. And I'd really just kind of put three things, security, privacy, and safety um, under this umbrella of trust, right? The idea of building products that people can trust are operating in their best interest and will not harm them. That, was, that has never been integral. That has always been something that has been over in the corner. Um, when I was CISO of Facebook, I reported to the general counsel uh, because you know, there are people when, when that, I wasn't the first person to do that, the CISO before me did as well because it was seen as reducing the legal risk to the company of the security practice. It was an integral part of the product decisions. Um, and that's how effectively all tech companies have operated is you have the really powerful people or people that most nobody has ever heard of Right? There are people bandied around as being the second most powerful person at Facebook and you can imagine the people, like folks who go on The View and, and who are you know, very public. And those people get a lot of blame. But the truth is, is the second through seventh most powerful people at Facebook are all product VPs that none of you would ever recognize their names. Because they're the ones who are making the decisions about how the products actually work and how billions of people interact with one another. And when they make a mistake, they call the security and privacy and trust teams and legal teams and comms teams for a cleanup on aisle six, right? Um, and that m movement of trust issues into peripheral groups has been a fundamental problem because it turns out a lot of these things you can't clean up afterwards, right? It's not just spilling the jar. Like there's a fundamental decision that has to be made very, very early in the building of these products. Um, and that's a, that's a real problem. But it's not a problem that's unprecedented in our industry. Um, unlike my 19-year-old undergraduates, I don't have to explain to you who this is. Um, but does anybody know what this video is from, these screenshots? Yes, this is the deposition of Bill Gates uh, by the Department of Justice in their antitrust lawsuit against Microsoft in the late 1990s. Apparently, my understanding is I also teach a law class while not being a lawyer. It's just kind of amazing uh, the credentials you can <laughs> rack up. Um, so I'm not a real law professor, even though I, I taught a law class, and um, which is an interesting experience. We can talk about that some other time. Um, but 
Uh, it does interesting things to people when you make them jump through every possible meritocratic hoop up until they're 23 years old and there's no more hoops to jump through. It like people go a little insane. Um, if you're like in a grad school at an Ivy League class college, it's, it's a very interesting phenomenon. But anyway, my understanding is that in civil procedure classes, um, sometimes this video is shown to new lawyers as the absolute way you do not want your client to handle a deposition. Um, this like Bill Gates deposition has, uh, it, you know, it's become a warning for folks. Um, although I've now been deposed, I think six times, uh, thanks to my last couple of jobs. By the way, they don't tell you about this, uh, that the word CISO, uh, comes with uh, possibly an 18 month span of work um, and then six years of getting questioned uh, by, by civil lawyers as well as criminal uh, investigators uh, for those 18 months. Um, there's like a three to one, four to one ratio of the amount of time uh, that you have to spend with the lawyers versus your ability to actually do work. I can't recommend becoming a CISO. Senior director, that should be your target. <laughs> Don't. That's good, that's the place you wanna be, right? Um, so, uh, the late 1990s, Microsoft had lots of problems. They had a lot of people complain about their monopolistic power, and I'm not really interested in talking about that. The other issue is that people blamed Microsoft a ton for their security, right? Because in the late 90s, early 2000s, we have the Nimda, we have Code Red, we have SQL Slammer, we have all of this automated malware causing huge damage, huge economic damage, and everybody's saying Microsoft makes shit software. That was true, but that was an incomplete statement. The real statement is humans make shit software. That was the accurate statement. Now everybody blamed Microsoft because they were the most visible consumer company, right? But the truth is in this period of time from 1991 to let's say 2005, effectively nobody in the world knew how to build software that was at least reasonably secure for outside attack, right? There were fundamental flaws that are the kinds of things that people find all the day now that we didn't even know those flaws existed. It was from this period of time a friend of mine, Tim Newsham, discovered format string bugs and then wrote a paper about it, right? Like these, these were like really exciting days because if you're in the security community, you could write a paper and invent an entire new class of issues of which you're like, oh, format strings, you can manipulate these things to control the stack and take control of execution. And all of a sudden, Microsoft has 250,000 new bugs that didn't exist the day before because of an entirely new class of issues. Um, so this was like a really interesting fundamental time and the, the reaction from Microsoft to this issue was actually really fascinating. Um, and as I think many people in here know, um, this is an email that Bill Gates sent, I believe in February of 2002, um, called the, now the Trustworthy Computing Memo. I also have to explain to my undergrads that this is what computers used to look like. Um, <laughs> that somebody decided that the most used operating system in the world, the default color scheme should be bright green and bright blue right next to each other. Um, People were kind of shocked. Um, uh, so yeah, so this is how the, the, this memo was experienced by most Microsoft employees on Windows XP and Office XP at the time. Um, and this was a memo in which Gates laid out kind of a new vision of how Microsoft was gonna build products that are what he called trustworthy. Um, and the result of this was a massive effort inside of Microsoft to invent the modern basis of, of secure software development. That effectively, the tons of things that we all do now that seem standard in our industry come out of this like five or six, seven year period after this memo was sent out in Microsoft. Because Microsoft built all this stuff and they brought in all these consultants and then a ton of people quit Microsoft and they went to other companies, they went to Google, they went to Amazon, um, they went to startups. And these, a lot of these ideas started to spread um, from this core thing. And that's effectively what we need to do again. Um, and that we're in the same place the entire industry was on kind of core information security uh, in the late 1990s, except now we're in that place on a much broader set of trust issues of building products that keep people safe, that work in their best interest, um, that respect their privacy while also balancing these equities in a reasonable way. And we haven't figured out yet how to do it. And one of the fundamental things we need to change is we need to change the relationship between the work that people like us do and the core products. Um, and the core decisions of how these companies are gonna operate and what they're gonna build. Um, and this is the kind of revolution we need to see again. Uh, and unfortunately though, there's not really any company standing up to do it, right? There's three or four companies in this place that they're effectively in the same place that Microsoft was. Google and Facebook would be the most obvious. Twitter to a lesser extent, Twitter's significantly smaller and has less international footprint. Um, so it's hard to put a lot of pressure on them, but like it would be nice to see one of these companies step up um, and, and, and to have the same kind of revolution that we had then. Um, because the truth is, is us in the tech industry have kind of, 
we've done a lot of wonderful things, but we also have to recognize um, that we're responsible for ruining shit, like uh, concerts. Like you can't go to a concert anymore without everybody holding up a phone with a really tiny little CMO sensor and thinking that that's a reasonable way to experience it. Um, and like, we have to take responsibility for this and for kind of the emergent properties of the technologies we build. Uh, and th you know, effectively, we have fought for a long time for people to take security seriously. We've, much of my time in the industry has been about getting people to think, oh, this is a big deal, and now they are listening, and we don't have a lot of answers yet. Um, and now that we've kind of won, we need to change our attitude a little bit on this and, and work on these big problems and engage with the world in a way that's a little more productive. Um, anyway, I think I have some time, but thank you very much for listening. Awesome. Uh, good morning. My name is Bryant. Um, hey. On the topic, you mentioned Twitter, um, and that reminds me of a comment from uh, from Jack Dorsey some time ago about um, I don't I can't quite quote him, but um, a difference between um, the freedom of speech versus the f versus reach. Yeah, um, that's a term actually my coworker at Stanford, Rene Duresta, made popular, so that he stole and then used in the Senate. But that's cool. <laughs> well, I mean, I he was, doesn't. He doesn't care that much. He's in a somewhere. He's in a monastery somewhere, that's uh, fair. smoking something. I'm sure and meditating. So he's cool. So I guess my I guess my question, um, but it seems like you kind of pseudo answered it. But I'm hoping for hope a longer one. Yeah. Um, is uh, what's what's your position on um, the difference between the two, if there is any, and whether or not that that might actually be an interesting or perhaps just an ineffective approach to solving the challenge of. Um, Maybe paid speech, I don't, I mean, right. generally. So, um, this is a complicated issue for which I actually have like a 50 slide deck, um, but I'll try to simplify in that I, I mean, I agree that, so one of the problems we have is that people are approaching these platforms as companies, and so they'll say something like, Facebook should do X without taking into account the fact that even just the Facebook app, so if you take away Instagram and WhatsApp and Oculus and stuff, the big blue Facebook app is really like 10 products all put together, right? And those different products have very different levels of amplification, they have very different types of abuse, um, and they have different levels of responsibility I think the company needs to take for them. Uh, and so the way I graphically demonstrate this is I have a, a PowerPoint smart art uh, because uh, again, that's like the, the best way I think to organize anybody's uh, thoughts is, is by the drop down in PowerPoint um, that get, lets you build those, but it's like an upside down triangle. And the idea is um, in this triangle, as you go up into the parts of the product that have the most amplification, the company has more responsibility and free speech rights decrease. Whereas you have the least amplification, generally we have a much more expectation of privacy. So at the bottom is like one-to-one -one messaging, right? If I am communicating with one person and they have, they want to be in that conversation with me, that conversation I think has the most implied um, privacy and free expression rights. The top of the, tr the triangle on most platforms I think is advertising. And there's a couple of things that are special about advertising. One, it allows you to trade money for amplification, right? So you don't have to organically convince people that you're, what you're saying is good. You can just say, well, how about a million dollars? And now you think my idea is good to be shown to lots of people, right? And so the trading of money for amplification is different. The other issue with advertising that's more and more subtle is um, it is one of the only ways on most social platforms that you can put content in front of people who did not ask to see it, right? And that's the other kind of right. We think a lot about the privacy of people. We think about the right of speakers to speak, but the other right we have to think about is the right of people to associate with others and to consume the content that they want to consume. And this is where like a lot of the arguments around anti-vax, for example, I find really frustrating. Um, I really dislike anti-vaxxers. Um, I have three kids in the California school system. The idea that one of them might get a disease from Little House on the Prairie is fucking ridiculous. But <laughs> I don't think the way to convince anti-vaxxers is to ask trillion dollar corporations to squash them, right? That like people have the right to choose to be stupid and to associate with people with these ideas and the way to convince them is to convince them 
with fact figures. Now, I don't think the anti-vaxxers should be allowed to use the platforms to massively amplify their views. And I think that's where the companies have a responsibility. But if you're going to have like a private group on Facebook and that private group's about talking about your views and you don't use it to do abusive things, that's a problem with some of the anti-vax folks is they'll create these Facebook groups and then they use it to like bombard pediatricians and stuff. So I think that needs to be stopped because that is an externality that the platform is responsible for. But if somebody is a choosing to, free to freely associate with a certain group and they want to consume the content, that is a right that we have to respect to a certain extent. And so I think you have a sliding scale of the kinds of things you do at every single level. Um, and this is why this takes 50 slides because to really talk about it, that's what you have to get. Um, the other thing, the other kind of access on that is whether or not somebody is part of the conversation willingly or not. And that's where I think we can start on a lot of this stuff is for almost every product I look at, there are ways that you can improve the ability for people to report whether they're being abused or harassed themselves, right? And so even in a one-on-one -on -one conversation, if somebody in that conversation says, something bad is happening to me, I want it to stop, they have the right to do that. And that's, mm -hmm. um, my team is working on kind of end-to-end -end encryption and safety. And like I said, there's <coughs> hard trade-offs with end-to-end -end encryption and safety, but one of the things that we could do a lot better is we could push a lot of the intelligence we use to look for abusive types uh, abuse types into the client itself and then prompt individuals who are part of an end-to-end -end encrypted conversation to do it. So if, if some stranger reaches out to a woman on an end-to-end encrypted messenger and the first thing they send is an image of their genitalia, that is something that a classifier can detect and say, not show them the image because you don't want the actual harm comes from the scene of the image. You could say, hey, a stranger just sent you something that we believe with an 87% confidence um, is, you know, uh, is, is a sensitive image. Do you want to report it? Yes or no? Like Clippy pops up. It looks like you got a dick pic. Would you like me to do something about it? <laughs> and you say, yes, Clippy, I want to do something about it. And then you can turn over the keys and the franking. There's an HMAC system that we had at Facebook for this. You can turn over that conversation. And so you can respect the privacy of the conversation, but you can also respect the recipient of the message and help them report the issue. And so I think there's a bunch of those things we can work on without only focusing on kind of centralized control of mass speech. Sure. Yeah, man. All right. One, one question. That's one more it. question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, great presentation. Very thought provoking. Brutally honest and very entertaining as well. Thank you. Um, I have two questions for you. Uh, first one is, uh, how come Stanford from CISO of Facebook to professor at Stanford? How how that journey has been? And my second question is, what are your views on differential privacy of uh, belonging to Apple? Um, I mean, the personal journey, I, I mean, I, things happened at Facebook that I wasn't being effective anymore, right? Like, I think, um, I, I don't like being portrayed as like this crazy whistleblower or whatever. I think that's like actually not a good model for people who want to affect change in companies. If, if you're going to work inside a company where you don't agree with everything, I think your standard should not be something happened I disagree with. Your standard should be, am I effective in bending the curve in a reasonable way? And there were changes inside the company that I was no longer effective in bending the curve. Um, and so I didn't feel like being there anymore. Uh, and I'm just fortunate in my career that I didn't, I, there's a lot of people who just can't walk away from the money and I, I was in a position where I could. So um, that was just luck on my behalf uh, for my career. Uh, the nice thing about going to university is I, I get to be honest. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't have to represent a corporate view anymore. Um, and like I said before, if you're not part of the emergency, then you kind of get to step back and you get to see the bigger picture, which is great. Mm -hmm. um, there's the things that are paying the ass of it, like trying to hire technical people in a university setting is extremely hard. Um, university HR is not a lot of fun. Um, the thing that everybody fights over is office space. This is like kind of a shocking thing. Um, <laughs> but like really important professors will end up with two or three offices and they can obviously only use one and generally they're using zero of them. And yet the fact that one person has three offices on campus and then other people get zero offices, like there's this whole hierarchy pecking order thing um, there's also kind of a real arrogance of like I'm a fake professor and there's a number of people who don't, who never take the chance to not remind me of that, but that's fine. Um, <laughs> the great part is you get to work with young people and this next generation of technologists are very thoughtful about what they want to do with the world. And I have lots of students come into my office hours and ask about career advice and they never ask what should I take for the money or what for the power. It's always about which of these jobs should I take so I can have the most impact. Um, and that, that actually makes me feel really good about the future. Um, as differential privacy, I think there's a lot of really, I would love to see more work in differential privacy, can anonymity, a bunch of other ways, because one of the, prob one of the basic equity issues, trade-offs that we haven't talked about is um, all of these privacy laws are disasters for any kind of research of what bad things are happening, right? Um, 
And you know, Cambridge Analytica started with an actual professor at Cambridge University. And that has meant that like GDPR, the FTC consent decrees, CCPA, none of them have exceptions for legitimate research and bad things happening. And so it's very hard to understand what's the impact of hate speech, you know, how, who's vulnerable to fake news. These are, these are questions that sociologists want to answer and it's extremely difficult to access the data set. The best possibility for that is the creation of differential privacy models that allow you to ask useful research questions without um, violating the privacy of any individual. Facebook has a project to do this called Social Science One. Um, it's run into a buzzsaw in Europe thanks to European privacy groups that want it not to exist at all. And I think that I would like to see the companies fight much more aggressively for this. And my fear is that they're not because in the end, what is the output? It's gonna be academic papers that criticize them. But in the long run, like I said, engaging with your critics and, and having transparency on what's actually going is one of the long term ways to get out of this problem. Thank you. Cool, I'm out of time. Thanks very much. Yeah. Thank you.